And this is where either the slope goes up or with Ruroc, my concern is, was there so much chaos around that brand that this doesn't even matter? So is Ruroc dead? I don't know, but I've had quite a history with this company. I've talked about the product quite a bit on this channel, so much so that I have 88 pages here. This is all communication that I had with an insider. I'm not really interested in going scorched earth. That is not my intent here. I am just trying to be transparent. Now I've struggled with how to tell this story for quite some time. This video is probably going to be rather long only because I wanna make sure that I am fair to everybody involved. Truth be told, I actually struggled quite a bit with how to tell this story until I just came across recently this Deloitte review fooled by the hype. And this gets into what is called the Gartner's hype cycle. I will link to this article in the description down below. It's actually a pretty good read and helps provide a little bit of context. I was never sponsored by the brand of Ruroc. I need to make that very clear early on. I've got quite a bit of helmets here. I actually just bought a new helmet, which I will cover at the very end of this video. I have no idea what's even in this box or what is to be expected. But I did see a comment on another video publicly from somebody who was formerly with Ruroc. This individual I actually have a ton of respect for. The story of Ruroc is so complicated to be discussed in YouTube comments. Only the people who were there at the time will know exactly what went down and still everybody will have different versions. I highly doubt that people who worked for the company have any idea that this exists. It's mind blowing. I definitely wanna talk about it because there's a lot to be learned from the story of Ruroc. So what is the Gartner hype cycle? I think it really fits this narrative so much that I'm actually going to chapter the video right alongside what the hype cycle is. It's an unscientific way of explaining how companies utilize hype to really build up a product and bring it to market. It's a framework around five ideas, it's an innovation trigger, a peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and then the plateau of productivity, which I think very well might be in this box. I have not opened it yet. This is a Ruroc Atlas 4.0 Street. This is their new fiberglass version of the Atlas 4.0, which prior to this, I believe all of their helmets have actually been carbon fiber, and they now have a sub $400 fiberglass helmet. I'm very interested to know what's in there. We'll get to it at the end of the video. But being a sub $400 helmet, I think that if they started out with this, it probably would have changed the evolution of the entire brand. And I don't think we would be having this discussion today had this been what they brought early on. Chapter one, the innovation trigger. The Atlas 1.0, their strategy seemed pretty heavily weighted around utilizing some big names in the social media space to garner a little bit of interest. The first time that I ever heard about Ruroc was in a Blockhead video. This was in 2019. And truth be told, at the time, I wasn't really all that interested in it. I didn't like the design language. Typically, we see designs that are maybe phallic in shape, but I learned a new word for this video, and that would be yonic. So that would be more the, I guess, feminine side of design. This is kind of what I saw. So I decided to paint scheme this up questionably. With Ruroc, they do have the uh, built-in Bluetooth audio. It's kind of hard as you're riding to reach around and change tracks. You don't really know where those buttons are. So I put a button uh, on the front here. You just flick the button here and that uh, would help change tracks. But I actually don't hate on the design. I don't think it's all that terrible. I went out of my way to kind of demonstrate what it was that I initially thought in those impressions. The whole idea of an innovation trigger is to create that interest and really get people wanting more. Now chapter two, peak of inflated expectations. And I would say this is the Atlas 2.0. This is when they really poured gasoline on the fire. Peak hype cycle for social media content. I think it was oversaturated. There was so much hype around not only what the Atlas helmet provided as a product, but what the company was. There was a lot of hype around Ruroc being a brand that was bootstrapped for the riders, by the riders, they were listening to what the riders wanted. They would make advancements in the products based on the feedback that they had received. 
there was a, a very well-rounded narrative behind what Rurock was. Now, this was February 2020 when you really started to see a whole bunch of this content show up. That was the launch time of the Rurock Atlas 2.0. But that narrative of the company being, you know, for the riders, by the riders kind of thing, started to get my head to turn a little bit and take a look. Chapter 3, The Trough of Disillusionment. This will be the Atlas 3.0. This is where I think the wheels really fell off for Ruroc. I don't know if they've recovered from it. I don't know if they ever will recover from it. This launch happened sometime around June of 2021. And you could tell the strategy was much the same. A lot of social media content geared around this helmet, but it did start to feel an awful lot like Groundhog's Day. So you started to see people say like, uh, is it just a cash grab? Are they beta testing helmets on people as they continually evolve? Now there was one very specific time that I remember where my interest was very much peaked with Ruroc, and that was around Moto Tigress, her video, specifically one part of that video where she shared why she was unhappy. There was an expectation of this premium liner and she showed what she got compared to some images of what were shown on some social media pages of the product. What you are seeing now is a photo comparison of the first set of pads that were designed for this helmet. And then on the right is the pads that were actually shipping with the helmet. If you set an expectation and you don't deliver, the, the swing from expectation to disillusionment is going to be that much greater. At the end of that video, I ordered a Ruroc Atlas 3.0. I cut it in half right alongside my showy helmet. It was really just a cheek pad story. To me, the cheek pads, they were garbage. <laughs> that cheek pad is garbage. <laughs> I also found at this point, Ruroc, they were watching videos. This is where the insider reaches out to me and the conversation begins. Hey man, just wanted to reach out and say nice video. Expensive, but nice. When our next iteration comes out, I'll drop you one to check out and see if the changes are what you'd have expected. And maybe you'll wanna ride with this rather than chop it in half. So my response was, I'm down as long as it's no strings attached kind of thing. I was impressed with the shell and main hard foam layer. So if the internals got polished, I would very likely change my opinion. I flat out said, send me whatever you want. Got to be no strings attached. Now the conversation went on uh, to say, uh, this is from the insider. <laughs> it's great that our only Moto Helmet Atlas is instantly compared to the number one uh, helmet brand in the world. But inevitably, uh, we've only been in the market since February of 2019. So we've got some catching up to do in certain areas. The only reason why this brand was being compared to the number one brand was because I was comparing similarly priced helmets. Had they have introed this helmet at what this new Atlas 4.0 Street is selling for sub $400, I don't think the backlash would have been nearly as significant, but the reason why they were being compared to the big fish is because they priced themselves there. One question I saw a lot of people asking was, did the YouTubers get a different helmet than what the consumers ended up getting? I can tell you that this liner is not the same as this liner. And I don't know if the cheek pads were the same. This helmet is not the same as that helmet. And it also doesn't match the liners that were sent out in social media posts. So I have more questions than answers on that front. Did, did a container ship come over with a bunch of product that wasn't up to the same quality control as the original run? And now they're sitting on a boatload of inventory. Are you now in a position as a company to look at this product and say, we've got two choices. Either we don't sell this product and go bankrupt because all of our money is tied up in this. Or do we ship it and see what happens? There was some weird narrative around the helmets came from one place, the cheek pads from another, and we're not going to ship an inferior product. But then people received what they 
perceived to be an inferior product. I mean, there's people were talking about it all over the place. So it continued on. Ruroc got to the point where they actually shipped out or offered new cheek pads that you could purchase. They were better. They really helped, I guess, the product along. But it's really tough when you sell somebody a really expensive helmet to even ask for a nickel for the quality that they were expecting from day one. Again, a lot of very, very disappointed people. At this point, I figured like, all right, I, I'm done with Ruroc. And I thought that I thought that I was done with Ruroc. Enter chapter four, the slope of enlightenment. This would be the Atlas 4.0. Uh, it was early January 2022. I was reached out to that, hey, we're launching the 4.0. Would you like to come to one of our events? And I figured early February, Phoenix to Las Vegas, it'd be a nice ride. I went out and bought some heated gear, took the trip up to, to Vegas. I never asked for any accommodations. With the dumpster fire that I went through with all of the other stuff and, and honestly, all of this stuff, it's like, man, I, I guess I'm in this thing now. So sure. You know, what the hell, I'll go up to Las Vegas. The moment that I got to this event, I started looking around and there were some very important faces that were not there. They literally invited a guy that cut one of their helmets in half to a reveal of a new helmet, uh, but not me. But I put that aside, I continued on with the entire event and I was absolutely blown away by the 4.0. So I got home and I was actually pretty excited to make the video to tell everybody how ridiculous this transformation was uh, with this product in terms of my perception. But I was also struggling with like, man, no, there, nobody's gonna believe this. Um, and I also had noticed there was one video, I think that I saw from a larger creator that came out around the launch and then a bunch of really, really weird radio silence. And I was like, still, I was noticing, it was noticeably vacant with content from the 2.0 and the 3.0. And uh, that was strange to me. The response that I got to my 4.0 content, uh, the first video I did was, that absolutely nailed what you were trying to say slash do in terms of maintaining the credibility. Hopefully, slash take you up on the challenge of independently buying and reviewing. These were two creators that I had mentioned in my video that I, I was hoping that they would actually buy it. I wasn't expecting that they would. Who's going to put their own money up? Uh, to uh, I'm the only idiot that did that. I didn't expect them to because they were already pretty burned by the brand. But I was kind of hoping that somebody would help validate that for me as an independent, as opposed to just what I thought was going to be an onslaught of a ton of sponsored content that was about to come down the pipeline. So yeah, I started noticing this, this vacuum of, of content that just didn't seem to exist. So I flat out asked, like, where is that other content? Like, why is there nobody else talking about this? Honestly, this is where the conversation went from what I thought I was providing as constructive criticism to feeling like I was carrying a narrative for a brand. So when I asked like, hey, why are your, your sponsored people not promoting at least the way or even at a, a a portion of the way of which they had previously, where's the content? The response that I got was um, this individual was pissed. I felt like there was probably a reason why they weren't, but I was more frustrated that I was one of the few that was and also had no affiliation with this company. Like, what's going on? I was asked if they could put my content front and center on their website. You know, my reply was... Honestly, I just didn't think it was a good idea. I said that because I don't think it's a good idea. Number one for my brand, the last thing that I was interested in was having my name on anything Ruroc because I already had people looking at me side eye because I was at the event and, you know, it's like I, I am adamantly not sponsored by Ruroc. I am making this content because I'm just uh, trying to make cool content. That was my only motivation. If you guys put me front and center on the website or any marketing materials for that matter, it's going to make people side eye even more. I would side eye. So it's like, if I would question that affiliation, uh, how would I expect others not to? I'm like, I'm not, don't use my name and my recommendation of this product in like a marketing material. It, it just the request to me seemed like, again, where are the, where's the big people? A few days went by and I ended up getting an email with my name front and center. Bye, bye, bye. I lost my mind. It was like, okay, look, 
something seems very wrong to me. Where is everybody else? I probably wouldn't have been as bothered if I didn't feel like they needed my narrative, otherwise it wouldn't succeed. But there was no agreement for any of that. As a matter of fact, we agreed that it would be a bad idea for them to do that. It just felt to me like they needed my narrative at that point because there wasn't enough of it out there. I ended up making a video where I shared with the people that I was not sponsored, I was not a part of that email, that I thought it was a bad idea, shared that whole thing. So this is uh, where I was asked, mate, is there any way of changing or doing another video or something? This is already affecting our sales. You know, you used my name and likeness in a marketing email. Uh, I had to publicly clarify that I wasn't sponsored by you guys. And now you're asking me to change my video. Not only did they ask me to change the video, they offered me a new title to the video of quote, I'm not sponsored by Rurock and never will be. I have an honest review and they've used it in their marketing, end quote. Because otherwise, quote, that's going to fuck us. But they were more concerned about how their carelessness was going to fuck their brand as opposed to what it was going to do to my brand. And the title that they were asking me to change it to acknowledged that fact that I was not affiliated with them. So even asking me to change the title to that was an acknowledgement that asking me to change the title was absolutely over the line, uh, no doubt about it. I got frustrated when about two months later, I saw a video drop uh, on basically a review video, and it was well after I had gone through all of this as an outsider. But 11 months later, I am very much not upset with the creator, I get it. But Block had made a video 11 months after this, and it was titled, uh, what was it titled? Rurock Exposed, which is fine. Again, I, I sort of get it. I understand that these creators very likely did not deal with this same person that I had dealt with. I would assume that they had a much more traditional media relationship. And I, I don't know if I would doubt that there was some gassing up on that narrative of clout chasing negativity. But I also don't know if they got the same helmet as everybody. Again, I, I don't know these, 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 these answers to questions that are still out there, but I would be lying if I did not say when I watched that video that I was like, ah, fuck this. Like, certainly was what came out of my mouth. The conversations ended. I have not had any more with Rurock. There's been some corporate shakeups. Uh, the people that were there are no longer. So now we're at chapter four, the plateau of productivity. Companies should go through the evolution of product, and then they get to this plateau of productivity. Now they've got the most viable version of the product that they're going to sell. And this is where either the slope goes up, or with Rurock, my concern is, was there so much chaos around that brand that this doesn't even matter. This is an Atlas 4.0 street. This has not been opened. This was opened in terms of tape when I received it. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean. This, I believe, is a fiberglass version of their helmet. I cannot believe that I spent money on another one of their helmets. Uh, this is the Atlas 4.0 street. It is a fiberglass version of their carbon fiber helmet. So this is more budget friendly. and I'm not going to hate on it, but that is nice of packaging. As I'm opening this, what's interesting as well is that Engine Hawk, which is their riding uh, clothing company, has seemingly halted. I don't, the, the website just links you back to Rurock now, um, which is unfortunate because I actually liked a lot of the stuff that they were selling. So it appears to me that they've either temporarily or permanently pulled the plug on that product. So this is the interior before before we pull anything out the interior the cheek pads feel okay they feel better than what came in the 3.0 they do not feel as nice as what's in the uh you know the carbon fiber more expensive helmet but 
Phew. Okay. It is uh, DOT and ECE 2206 uh, compliant. It only comes with one visor, clear. You don't get you don't get a uh, you know an array of visors, but the 3.0 and 4.0 visors do work with it. You also don't have the FID lock, so you've got a traditional D ring. I don't care about the FID lock at all. I feel like part of the hype cycle made that FID lock um, much more of a talking point than what I ever thought it actually ever was. This is an XL, the same size. And this feels like a $300 helmet. I mean, I don't love it, I don't hate it, but I also ride with a more expensive showy. This feels like what a $300 helmet would feel like. Yeah, the 4.0 feels much nicer. I mean, I, I, I don't even want to say much nicer. The 4.0 feels nicer. So, the the question that I have here is, if Ruroc came out with this fiberglass lid, it's got all the same mechanisms for opening and closing the, the ventilation. I mean, it feels respectable. I would say this feels as good as any other $300-ish dollar helmet out the door with tax, shipping was free. I paid $300.76 for this helmet. Had Ruroc shipped this sub $300 helmet, I think that people would have been happy with what they paid for possibly. And I don't think you would have seen all of that backlash. I think the further the hype gets from the actual delivered product, the harder it is to come back from. And that's why I question, is Ruroc dead? Look, I, I think there's a lot of very great, great, great people that worked for Ruroc, that still work for Ruroc, that believe in the mission, that whole idea of being a, a grassroots helmet company, developing uh, you know, unique product, whether you like the design or not, it is certainly unique. But like anybody watching this video, you have a job and you are not responsible for the execution of people above you. And unfortunately, that execution can hurt the, the people that are working within the, the organization. Even the people doing great things. I mean, this liner and this 4.0 is something that nobody else has ever done in the industry with this. The people that designed this interior after the 3.0 deserve a ton of credit. Um, you know, the people who were who were honestly doing the hype. Some of the hype stuff that I saw come out of, of Ruroc, they're marketing people. They're brilliant. Uh, the marketing people are never responsible for the manufacturing execution. Those two things never mix. So the marketing people, incredible. None of that should be lost. Uh, I just want to make sure that, you know, you guys understand that I'm not dogging on people here. I am talking about a company... Uh, even this whole back and forth, I view this as the company speaking to me, not a person speaking to me. Uh, I put that on the company. I don't put that on the people. I hope that the insider that I was dealing with has learned from the things that uh, transpired throughout this whole process. And I have been recording now for an hour and 50 minutes. This is going to be a very long edit. So help me God, but hopefully I can get this down. I don't know how I'm going to get this down, but it's over. I'm happy it's over and I wish them the best of luck. I hope they're at this plateau of productivity where people start coming to the, te the table, buying their good 4.0, buying what seems to be good budget helmet. Time will tell. And I am not a part of that story, nor will I be. And, uh, you know, again, uh, Godspeed for, for Ruroc, and um, that's it. So thank you guys very much for tuning in. If this is your first time tuning in, please hit that subscribe button down below. Remember, likes go a long way to help support the channel. See you guys next time. <sighs>